Bible, I'm sure they will project the verses up on the screen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I want to begin reading with verse 1. First Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated in Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from deceit or uncleanliness, nor was it in guile. We have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is our witness. Nor do we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have been made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we not be burdened to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are a witness, and God also, and how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believed. As you know, we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would have a walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. May God preach blessing me to his word and may it be sanctified in our hearts. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word brings to us an illumination, an insight, a perspective that we do not have and cannot have apart from your divine revelation. And now, Father, we pray that you might indeed anoint your word, that it will indeed speak to us and anoint our hearts, our minds, and our souls, and our spirits to receive your engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Speak a good word to every soul that's here, particularly those who never come to faith in Christ. May they see that Jesus Christ, the lover of their soul, their only hope of forgiveness and salvation, their only way to escape the coming judgment. And may they put their faith and trust in the living Christ today. For it's in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. You may be seated. I want to speak this morning just uh, from a few moments from just a simple subject uh, of a father's charge, a father's charge. I know that many of you have been watching the NBA basketball finals, and I think game five, which is normally the decisive game in the five-game series, it kind of tilts the momentum, is scheduled for this evening. And there was an interesting uh, comment that was made just the other night uh, that Greg Popovich, the very talented and very successful coach uh, for the San Antonio Spurs, uh, he's a hollerer and a screamer. And he's an equal opportunity hollerer and screamer. He treats all of his players the same. It doesn't matter whether the guy, the last guy on the bench who uh, seldom gets in the game or his, his superstars, uh, Ginobili and uh, Tony Parker and the gifted and skilled Tim Duncan. And they say he coaches everybody the same. And Tim Duncan commented, he says, he says, Pop, think I will play harder or better if he hollers at me. But that just isn't necessary. <laughs> that isn't necessary. It's something that he never liked, and Tim Duncan doesn't like it. He's a guy with an even temperament, and he doesn't like hollering and, and saying, but that's, that's the way Popovich is. And they've got this, this relationship, uh, several NBA championships, and both of them are very successful, and both are headed to the Hall of Fame. But... Duncan's point was, it really isn't necessary to holler at me. <laughs> I really could relate to that. And I was fortunate as a young person coming to playing sports because I seldom had coaches that did a lot of hard. And I had one. I had one. Head coach Gene Spadaro of the football Mustangs and the track. 
Gene Spadaro started hollering from the time we got near the practice field. And he could just get you down and make you feel so bad, he would look at you and he would say, watch, you're just one sorry human being. <laughs> and he would holler and he would scream and he got this gravelly voice. And I never remember we were playing ball, football, you know, and, and uh, when you're in the 10th grade, of course, you scrimmage against the varsity. And so as younger guys, we took pride and they'd be very competitive against them. And so I play quarterback, so I'd be making up plays. And instead of running the plays that we were supposed to be running, I would make up plays. And so the defense hadn't saw the plays that we'd make up in the huddle. And so the guys on my team were a lot of my, my friends. We played in the same neighborhood together. We had our sandlot plays. And so we would come out and we would do razzle-dazzle stuff and we'd make the first team defense uh, look bad because we could pass the ball and they wouldn't use that this type of other. We would try to run it, they would kill us. But we passed and did reverse and stuff like that. We could make big yards and they would just drive Coach Gene crazy. <laughs> and I remember one day he put me up, he said, all right. And he used to call me Eubanks. It wasn't even my name, but that's what he called me. Greg's remember that he called me Eubanks. It's my brother's name. He said, all right, Eubanks, you come over here. So he put me over here with the other team. And they ran these crazy plays. We had these crazy plays with crazy names to them like Go Right, Bonsai, Blue Belly. Just remembering this stuff. He was trying to come up with this offense. We weren't using numbers anymore. We had names, Blue Belly, Bonsai, Go. And so you had to remember this long name to tell who was going to split out and who was going to flank and all this stuff and other. And so it would just be confusing. And I'd call the play and I would come out the hole and I would turn the wrong way and throw the ball in the wrong direction. I don't forget. He said, ah! He said, get on back over with the substitutes. <laughs> He said, I bring you over here with a team that can do something and you just play. Just get back on over there with the substitutes. And so I would go back with the, with the substitutes, the second team. And we would come up with our plays and we would, we would razzle dazzle him. He'd be so frustrated. He'd just holler and scream. He was a great coach. He really was. Incredible coach. An incredible, incredible man. And still living in that neighborhood now. Uh, he coached a track team for about 15 years after he retired. And they run several championships. He's probably in his 80s now. And I saw him a few weeks ago when I went back to home. I'll never forget that. But I never like people hollering at me. Just tell me what you want me to do. I'll try to do it. It's not necessary for you to holler. Decibel levels does not help me concentrate any better. All right? You tell me what you want me to do, I'll try to do it. If I can't do it, I'll tell you I can't. But hollering at me, you're not going to get any more out of me. So I really could relate to Tim Duncan when he said that. So fortunately, only Coach Federer was the only holler I had. The other coaches never hollered. As a matter of fact, I only had one coach in my entire athletic career that I ever heard curse. Only one. And it wasn't Coach Gene, it wasn't Coach Devil to Act. And, and my college coach, I never heard him curse, not one time. And he was probably the most as, as competitive as anybody that I ever knew in my life. But he, he never did that, and I really admired him uh, for that. And so I was thinking about this idea of a father's charge and, and the role that athletics play in the lives of children. Uh, boys and a growing number of young girls and how very often they're able to respond and they will respond to the charge of an athletic coach when very often they won't respond to the charges of other people who are trying to give them instruction. And I've been trying to figure that out and understand it. Why can't we get the same discipline and the same concentration and the same effort from elementary kids and middle school kids in the classroom that we can get on the athletic field? On the athletic field, you got 22 little bitty people going in all different kind of directions, but when the whistle blows, everybody know to stop. And very seldom in the Major League football game do you get an unsportsmanlike penalty. Now, if I was the referee, I could call an unsportsmanlike penalty almost on every play on the coaches. Y'all supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> on the coaches, they're not playing the game. The boys are playing the game, and some girls are playing the game, and they play with tremendous sportsmanship within the rules of the game, stopping when the whistle say stop, doing what they're supposed to do. But sometimes the coaches are out of order on the sideline and should be penalized out of the stadium. Well, this last week, and I showed you last week, there was a major victory. The Midland League sports teams here on the west side of Charleston, the football teams, the, uh, the generals, the uh, from the, the west side here. Uh, they 50 years of playing Major League Football. And the Midwesterns are over 40 plus years that men and women have organized these teams for these kids to play. And so there was a, there was a clandestine conspiracy basically to 
um, dissolve those teams and, and basically so there wouldn't be teams on the west side because other places don't want to play the teams here because of the superior teams that are put together. But a threat of a lawsuit basically calls the other side to blink and they agree to accept uh, the west side teams into the Kanoi County Youth Football League and there would be, there will be football on the west side this fall for Midget League so the world is not going to come to an end. Uh, football will be played. Plus, I thought about this, and I did, and we had meetings here. We tried to challenge these coaches and the people involved that we got to decide, do we want to merely play football? Or do we want to create a movement to surround our children with the best experiences we possibly can so they can grow spiritually, academically, educationally, as well as physically through the idea of playing football? The question is, what do we want to do? Just play football? Or do we really want to do something with the best interest of these children? We're going to see here in coming weeks uh, where our real commitment lies. But as I thought about these coaches and I thought about their, the influence that they have, the coaches that coach middle league sports have more influence over children than anyone else in this neighborhood, including the teachers, the preachers, the principals, the school board, the mayor, anyone else. No one has the influence over these young people as the coaches do. And as I thought about it, and I've had this running little kind of uh, uh, gentle feud over the years with some of these teams, and I concluded, you know, some of the coaches, they holler too much. Some of them curse too much. Some of them fuss too much. Some of them drink too much. And some of them smoke too much. But you know what? They're there. They are there, and that's the difference. The difference is they have an unprecedented commitment that most of them expend 22 to 25 hours a week with somebody else's children. They are there. They pick them up, they take them to games, they take them from games, they feed them some time, they raise the money, they buy the uniform, so even the parents doesn't play, pay, everybody gets to play. They are there, and their commitment is powerful. And their commitment is what gives them power because the children recognize they can depend that their coach is going to be there and going to provide them with the structure they need to play the game. So you can't ignore that. You have to respect that. You have to recognize the power of presence. The power of somebody being present when someone else wants them to be present and the influence that presence gives individuals. So at the end of the day, the church has to decide how much influence do we want to have, and if we want to have influence in the lives of young people, how much of a commitment we're going to make to have presence, to be present to, with them, to be available to them, to be accessible to them so they sense that they have some value to us. And some of you are there. I, I commend you. Some of you are here Mondays. We work with these children at this church. You're here Tuesdays. You're here on Wednesdays. And you're here on Thursdays. And some of you are here all of those days. And I commend you for that because that is what is needed. We have to have some group of children that we got influence over. That we are influencing how they think. And we're influencing what they value. And that becomes powerful because that's the way you raise up a legacy. And that's the way you have heirs to pass on things that are important to you. I see this in the Apostle Paul. And I'm not going to be long because I see y'all are hot and tired. But in this text, we see this in the Apostle Paul. His approach to ministry is so balanced. So he opens up there in verse 1 of chapter 2. And this, the theme of the first part of this chapter 2 is about his conduct, his conduct among the church believers at Thessalonica. So he reminds them, he says, first of all, you know yourselves what our coming was about, and it wasn't in vain. The first thing I see in Paul is that Paul had a clear purpose for what he was doing, and that purpose he was communicating to these Christians and to those whom he was trying to disciple. And in essence, what Paul was saying, we are going somewhere. Paul was saying, I have purpose. What I'm doing is not in vain. It's just not a bunch of theological 
uh, shadow boxing. I'm going somewhere. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm moving towards spiritual growth, spiritual maturity, spiritual development, and everybody who's associated with me, we're going on this spiritual journey together. We're going somewhere. And we're going to have an impact upon this world for Jesus Christ, and we're going to have a last and testimony throughout eternity because we live our lives on purpose. Paul says, my life has not been lived in vain. In 1 Corinthians, he talks about, he says, I'm not one that's shadow boxing. I'm not one that is just beating the air. Paul says, I'm living my life every single day on purpose. I am going somewhere. So he says to the church at Thessalonica, y'all knew we weren't living in vain. We were going somewhere. Purpose. As men, we must have purpose. We must be trying to go somewhere. We must be trying to convince somebody, I'm going somewhere. It's an exciting journey. Don't you want to go? And the destination is going to be fabulous when we get there. But not only is the destination going to be wonderful, the journey is going to be joyous. And so ministry is about trying to enlist people to join you on this journey and let's go somewhere together for the glory of God. Purpose. Purpose. But not only did he have purpose, Paul had endurance. Verse 2, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much affliction. Some people can be purposeful when it's easy. Some people can shout as long as they're being blessed, as long as they are healthy and their family is healthy and their children are healthy, but what about when conflict comes? And Paul said we had endurance we had stick to he says, because even when the tide turned against us and it appeared that we were not blessed but cursed and God allowed us to be beaten physically, physically beaten by our enemies and at times to the very inch of our lives, Paul says we had the endurance to endure because we knew we were going somewhere that God has called us with a sense of purpose and we were on a journey and we were moving somewhere. We must have a sense of purpose and we must have endurance and we just can't collapse when the going gets tough. We can't give in and we can't throw in the towel and we cannot allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by the circumstances where we become disillusioned to think that tomorrow has to be bad because today is bad. Tomorrow doesn't have to be bad because today is bad. The weather should teach us that. It can be raining, the wind can be blowing, it's storming today, and tomorrow the sun might be shining. All we got to do is just endure today to be ready to take on the opportunity that tomorrow might bring, and that takes endurance. The ability to stand up under the burden, under the pressure, under the weight of the moment. That's why James says in James 1.5, 1, 5, he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptation, knowing that the trial of your faith works patience. Let patience have its work. Let it develop in you the spiritual muscle that you need. So as fathers, we got to have a sense of purpose. We got to have a sense of endurance. And we just can't give up because things get hard and things are difficult. That's what troubles me today about young people. It's troubling to me that many of them are unable just to stay in there and keep trying and putting forth the effort. The least little thing seems to discourage them. It's where they want to quit. Or they want to give up and say, this is too hard. This is not fair. No, life is not fair. If you understand that coming out of the block, it will serve you well. It's not fair. And it's never going to be fair. You've got to figure out how to survive and function, how to thrive in a world that is unfair. But you believe that God is bigger than the unfair rules that the world might make. Thirdly, not only did they have a sense of purpose and a sense of endurance, endurance and tenacity and steadfastness, there was a regal boldness, a regal boldness, a spiritual confidence that we have when we believe that God is indeed with us. Now, we have to be careful that our confidence does not project as arrogance, but we have to have a sense of boldness. If God is with me, I can do whatever God says I can do, and at least I'm going to try to do it for his glory, a boldness. He says, so even in the midst of conflict, we were able to function in the midst of conflict. Even though when conflict was against us and contrary to us, because of our purpose, our endurance, and our stamina, and our boldness, we were still able to function and make an impact. Verse 3, for our exhortation did not come from deceit or uncleanness, nor was it in guile, but we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak. 
not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. And so they recognize the source of their authority, the source of their authority, the source of their power, the source of their authority and power. It came from God, and many Christians, they live their lives as if they're not sure where their authority and where their power comes from. Our authority and our power comes from God. It is delegated to us through the Holy Spirit that we receive when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. It is revealed and unveiled to us as we understand the Word of God and as we learn how to practice the Word of God in the way we live our lives and practice using the Word of God to influence situations and circumstances which shows the power of God. So Paul says, we didn't just have nice sayings and nice words. We knew we had been entrusted with the very Word of God which gave us power and it gave us authority and we know that God's Word will not return unto him void. It's going to get something done. It's going to get something done. Verse 5, so we didn't use flattering words at any time. As you know, as a cloak to cover up our covetousness, our real motivation to try to get your money out of your pocket into our pockets, that's not what this was about. This was about lift up the name of God. Nor do we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. So Paul says we didn't even exercise our apostolic authority, which we could have exercised and required you to do certain things for us because we're the apostles, the ones chosen and sent by God. No, we didn't do that. But verse 7, and this is where I'm trying to get. But we were gentle among you. Just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only gospel, but also our own lives because you have become dear to us. Now here's what this is interesting. This is the side of the Apostle Paul that we don't always see. This hard driving Apostle Paul, the same one who had no patience with John Mark when John Mark stuttered and stammered and defected and when John Mark did not have the courage to continue on the missionary journey and when Barnabas said he's just a young man, he has to mature, he has to develop, let's give him another chance and Paul said no, no. Send him back home to his mother. And Paul did have no patience with John Mark. Now this other side of Paul, he talks about even as a nursing mother cherishes her children. Those of us in positions of authority and those of us who in this fatherly role, we have to recognize there needs to be a tender side that we have. A tender side that we have that allows us to minister to the spirits of people. People's spirits are broken. Their confidence has, confidence has been shattered. And now the experts are unveiling all this through research. And they call it these adverse child experiences. And I was in a conference some days ago and they were talking about how it affects children when they have these adverse childhood experiences in those early formative years. I'm talking about in vitro, I mean inside the womb, as well as before they can even talk. Because the brains are developing so rapidly and it's refining itself and so the brain is processing every experience this child is exposed to. So their temperament and even their intelligence is being determined in those first 18 to 24 months of life. And some researchers have done what they call how to raise the Einstein children. And you raise them by playing uh, classical music while they're in the mother's womb. You raise them by keeping the mother from having stressful situations and arguments and bittering and fighting and so forth, the things we haven't thought a whole lot about. And you create the most nurturing environment possible and you talk to them even before they can talk back. Because what that does, it, it forces the brain to process all this information. And now the doctors are saying that there are certain things that we lose before age three we cannot recover, cannot be recovered. Because the opportunity right there, it is so powerful because of the way the brain wires itself and the way it is programming itself to respond to things at the early age. 
so that we transfer that to the church. Now we understand that we got to nurture people. Uh, we got to nurture them. We, we got to nurture young Christians. We got to pray for them. We got to encourage them. They're going to fall down. They're going to make mistakes. Uh, they're not going to live up to our lofty expectations of things that took us 15 years to do. They're not going to do it in 15 days. You can raise a chicken in 30 days. You can't raise a mature Christian in 30 days. They got all of these steroids and all this stuff. They can pump in this stuff right now. They're raising chickens with legs this big. More chemicals and steroids and stuff that they're putting in these animals. And we wonder why we got all these health problems. Because we're consuming too much, too much chemicals, particularly that they use in, in meats. Well, that's too convicting. I ain't going to talk about that because they, 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 they might as well send me to heaven right now if they say I can't have chicken. Just let me go right now because I know they got something up there. So Paul said we have to have this tender side. Because it's the spirit we're trying to get to. We're trying to get people to open up their spirit to us, to allow us to minister them into that intersection where they make decisions and choices and where the real you really lives. And to do that, it takes a lot of nurture. It takes a lot of tenderness. The people got to believe that you can forgive them no matter what it is they do, that they can be forgiven, that they never can lose your love for them. And then they believe that it's worth me taking the risk to allow them into this inner part of me. You know the most dangerous society to live in, and I will say this repeatedly, I'm not getting old, I know I've said this before, the most dangerous society to live in is a society where young people are not connected with caring adults giving them counsel and advice. Where young people do not value a relationship with a caring adult enough that they don't want to lose the relationship so they will conform their behavior because they want the relationship. Because in this society, by the time a child gets to be 12 years old or 13, you can't do nothing with them unless they let you. They're bigger than we are because they're eating all these processed foods. They were inside 12 and 13 shoes. Now kids, the size of their shoe is the same size as their age. They get to be about 13 or 14. These girls are developing so fast because all this stuff they've been exposed to, they're grown physically. And physically, they could just about beat us if they really tried. So now we have to have them to love us enough and respect us enough and trust us enough that they will continue to allow us to instruct them and they will heed our charge to them because they don't want to lose the relationship they have with us. Otherwise, they can call 911 they'll come and take you to jail and put you in a DAHR training program to help you become a better parent. And that's all the government knows how to do. Can't fix anything, but there's a problem. We say, okay, let's counsel the one that listen to it because the kid's not going to listen. Let's counsel the parent. This is a dangerous society. It's a dangerous society that we are creating because we're creating too many young children who have not been nurtured by their mothers and their fathers haven't been nowhere around so they don't have a healthy relationship with a caring male figure in their life that they will respect and trust. And if you don't believe me, come with me at 10, 11, 12, or 1 o'clock at night. And they're walking down the streets of the west side of Charleston, not the sidewalk, in the middle of the streets. Now, am I exaggerating? Anybody who live on the west side? And they're not high school kids. I'm talking about middle school kids and some elementary school kids. And the city won't do anything because there's nothing they can do. They can't even impose the curfew. And I got people calling me about a pack of kids, stop my car and slam the brick into the side of it. So I rolled down 2nd Avenue, 12 o'clock the other night, and there are about 25 or 30 young children that are below the age of 16 in the middle of the street. Am I exaggerating, my brother? No, I'm not exaggerating. They're, they're roaming the streets. Not under authority. And the parents can't make them do nothing. This is a dangerous society we're going to. And that's why the church is so important. That's why the church is so important. And that's why the Midland League football program is so important because they got a group of 200 kids in a structure where they will listen to somebody because they want to play football or they want to cheer. And so while they're still willing to listen, we got to make sure we're exposing them to stuff worthy of them listening to. And they need to know about the Bible and about God and about the Word of God and about biblical morality and about God's expectation that they will apply themselves intellectually, cognitively to develop every area of their life. They need to understand that that's what God expects for them. 
God gave them a brain, and God wants them to use that brain to develop that brain to be able to process information, to think critically, and to make solid moral decisions for themselves and for everybody around them. And in a world where there's a moral free fall, where we don't even know what's right and wrong, we can't even agree what's right and what's wrong because we can accept no authority as the basis for morality. So as a church without compromise, we got to stand up and say, no, we know the way. We know the difference between right and wrong. We have an authority, and we believe that the biblical morality of the Bible is a morality that's good enough for us all. And we're not going to force it on anybody, but this is what we believe. If you want to follow us, come and join us, and let's see how our respective lives turn out. That's what it's going to be to be a Christian in the 21st century. It's going to be the, the ability to downshift and to upshift and to penetrate every single sphere of our society, whether it's youth sports, whether it's academia, whether it's middle school, high school, whether it's the business world, and bring about what God has said. Because if you think that morality rests in the White House or in Congress or in the election, it does not. That's the most confused group of people of all because they can't even do what they think is right because they fear they might lose votes. So now their morality is held hostage by their desire to be reelected to the office the next time, so they can't even do what they think is right, and most of them won't even say what they really mean, believe to be right. They always got some nuanced answer, some nuanced spin that they're going to put on it to be in the middle of the road, because the middle of the road is how you win elections by and large. There has to be a light. There has to be a clear clarion voice. There has to be a seat of authority. There has to be a group of people who say, we're going somewhere, and we're, going, we're doing something significant, and we're going to a place of grandeur. Well, let me wrap this up. Look at what Paul says. For you remember, brethren, our labor and our toil. Our labor and our toil, and the words in the Greek text that Paul uses for labor and toil, from which we get the word energy, it is the idea of laboring and toiling to the point of exhaustion. To the point of exhaustion. Now what's happened today in our society, we have flipped the script. We used to respect people that served us. We used to respect people that sacrificed for us that gave of their time and their effort, their energy, their talent, and their treasure. Now we celebrate celebrities. So just because someone is supernaturally gifted in some area to do something, it doesn't matter they have any moral ballast about them or any moral bearings. It doesn't matter they never do anything to help anybody. We celebrate them and we make them great and we worship them like they're some icon. And the people that serve us and sacrifice us, we basically take them for granted and ignore them. Now look what Paul says. Paul says, we labored and we toiled. We labored and we toiled to the point of exhaustion night and day so that we wouldn't be a burden upon you but a blessing to you so we could preach the gospel to you. But then back up in verse 8, which I missed, he says, so affectionately longing for you we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel, but our own lives, because you were dear unto us. That's what we're trying to do as Christians. We're just not trying to give people some theological mumbo-jumbo, telling people what somebody else said about what somebody else has said. No, we're trying to be the embodiment of the life of Jesus Christ, allowing Christ to live his life through us, through the Holy Spirit, a life that is exemplary, a life that is worth people emulating and modeling, and then we're trying to pour ourselves into those folk. We're trying to pour ourselves into other individuals so they can benefit from our spiritual heritage, our spiritual legacy. They can benefit from our spiritual work, and they will have our shoulders to stand on. We're at a crossroads, an incredible crossroads because what has happened, there's such brokenness and there's such dysfunction in our society today, particularly in poor communities and the black community in general because by and large the black intellectual has left the church, outgrown the church. 
when there used to be a time when the black intellectual gave his or her mind to the church because it recognized that the church needed the intellectual training insight that it had gained to be able to know how to function in a complicated, changing society. So now, more and more, by and large, you're seeing the best minds, the brightest minds outside the church, not connected to the church, and not seeing the church has been the only institution historically that the African community has ever had to build upon and to strengthen families and to strengthen youth and to give a clear vision of what we can do and what we can become and create a sense of solidarity. We are all in this together. And so now we're in the middle of nowhere. Spiritual nowhere, no more than what we've ever known before and got all this knowledge, but we don't know how, what to do with it because we have no system of transferring that knowledge into the lives of other individuals and into an institution. And so what I'm suggesting is the church has to be the repository of not only the spiritual insight and knowledge from the Bible, the church also has to become a repository of, of intellectual information because the church has the ability to transfer that information on to the next generation and they're going to need it all to function in this society that we have developed here in this, these United States of America. Well, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm from the country, y'all. I told people all the time, if they would have played basketball in the summertime, I would have really been something. Because my body functions better in the summertime. When it's hot like right now, I'm leathered up. I could preach for another hour, but I ain't going to do it. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to resist the temptation to do it. The higher my temperature get, I believe the more adrenaline kicks into my body, I could probably preach for another hour. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to shut it down right here. And look what he says. Again, verse 9, you remember, brethren, our labor, our toil, for labor night and day, that we might be, not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. So Paul has this balance of tenderness, of affection, of nurture, of a mother, and then the charge, the exhortation, the responsibility of a father. And you know why young boys respond better in athletic events? Because they have men charging them like a father, exhorting them like a father, demanding certain things from them like a father. So on a football field or a basketball course, the coach never says you can't do something. He never says you cannot do it. He says you are not living up to your potential. You are not doing what you have the ability, the capacity to do. And he's always trying to pull their performance up by appealing to them based on what he believed to be their potential and their innate ability that they have. And so a coach on the west side would never say to a football player, you can't tackle the kid from South Hill. You can't tackle him. There's no way you can tackle him because his mama is a lawyer and his daddy is a doctor and there's no way you can tackle him. There's no way you can do it. A coach would never say to a kid from the west side, you can't tackle the kids from Kanoa City. You can't guard them on the basketball court because they have higher west test scores than you. No, the coach would say, you can do it because you come from the west side and it's a tough neighborhood and you've had to fight harder to get out of your house than you've got to fight on the football field. And there's no way that they can beat you because you've been fighting all your life. So there's no way you can be defeated. So you appeal them based on their potential and based on their experience. And what I'm saying, we got to have that same commitment when it comes to academics, when it comes to morality, when it comes to spirituality. You've got the stuff inside of you. You have what it takes to be world class. Now what you got to do is activate your world class ability with what I call a healthy dose of want to. You got to want to do it. I don't care where you live in West Virginia, even the United States of America, you can get an education if you want to. 
because in this state we have a law in the Western State Code, every child is to receive an efficient and effective education, and the money has to be allocated by the same amount, about $10,000 a piece, and all the books got to be free, and then everybody can, 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 can eat lunch and breakfast for free, and so just take advantage of everything that they're giving you, and what you don't get at school, go and ask somebody in the neighborhood, and I bet you they'll help you. But you got to want how to want to. You got to want to do it. I got a friend of mine in this church this morning. I'm not going to embarrass her by asking her to stay. She's from South Central Los Angeles, California, from the toughest neighborhood in the United States of America. Nobody thought she wanted to be anything. Now she got a PhD because she had to want to. And she got up and traveled 3,000 miles to come to West Virginia to get an education because she wanted it. And she will not let anybody keep her from getting it. And that's the people we got to get our kids exposed to. We got to get our kids exposed to the folk who not just talk about it, but who are about it and who have done it and who will say to them, don't give me your excuses. Dry up your tears, okay? This is not a pity party. We got to get it done. And if we do that, we can raise up some champions. And that is what is needed. We got to raise up champions, spiritual champions that are also intellectuals. Because this is going to take some intelligence to get ourselves out of the mess that we're in. I can close with this. I'm a man of prayer. I'm a man of prayer. I'm telling you, a man of prayer. I'm praying all the time. Every time I phone when I say pray, I pray, Lord, I want to say the right thing. Let me do the right thing. I'm trying to be in prayer. But let me tell you what. If we are walking down over in the mountains of Kanoa City, and we run up to a big black bear. Don't ask me to pause no prayer meeting. <laughs> now, prayer meeting might serve you well in a prayer meeting, but a prayer meeting don't help you too much in a bear meeting. We got to run for it. We got to move. And if we ain't got some type of weapon, we got to run. We got to get up out of there. So a prayer meeting has its place, but in a bad meeting, you got to have a whole nother philosophy. So we got to pray and we got to fight. We got to pray. We got to learn. We got to pray and we got to push. We got to pray and we got to fight for what's right and what's fair. And we fight fair and we fight right and we fight in a just way. But we got to fight on our hands. Well, this is the Father's charge. And we just got to have a, a handful of men that's willing to try to do their part. The women going to do their part. We just need a handful of men that's willing to do their part, to labor, to toil, to sacrifice, to be there, and to be present. I never will forget, and I close with this, I was uh, at a meeting with uh, Dr. Jawanda Kanjufu, and he's one of the leading black sociologists, those types. He did all this study of what's happening with black boys. He's written several books about black boys and what's happening to them. And uh, Kanjufu talks about it. He talks about the third grade syndrome or the fourth grade syndrome. In our culture, you learn how to read preschool into the third grade. And then you read to learn for the rest of your life. So if you haven't learned how to read by the time you get to fourth grade, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And you need big help. Because after the fourth grade, we don't quite know what to do. And he talks about that. He talks about we got to rally everybody together. And we got to understand and making sure our boys and our girls know how to read before they leave elementary school should be a priority on our agenda. Otherwise, we're going to pay for them in the juvenile justice system, in the criminal justice system, with the social welfare system. That's where we are. And so as men, we got to realize there is a role that we have to play. We have to have presence. And the Kanjufu tells a story that they run this program in Chicago, and they had this little deal they were doing. And the drug, drug dealer say, he said, hey, Doc, when you finish with those boys, they mine. They belong to me. And Kanjufu, you know, kind of in self right well, you mean it belong to you? He said, well, you got your little Sunday school. You got your little program. And then when you're gone, I'm here. When they get off from school, I'm here. When they're in the neighborhood in the evenings, when y'all go on to the clubs, I'm here. They belong to me. 
They belong to me because I'm here, they're here, and you're not. They belong to me. I never will forget that. Because I said, the guy was right. Presence is powerful. Presence is incredibly powerful. And so we can't be there for everybody, but we can be there for a group of young people that are willing to let us be there and try to raise up another generation uh, that can take this thing a little bit further. I'm way out of my time. I thank you for yours. Let's pray together, shall we?